Open with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. It's sometimes one of our benediction, uh, benediction readings that we read as we end the services. And I grew up in the church. And I, uh, I grew up in the church was a little bit more traditional. Uh, well, a little bit will be maybe understatement, a lot more traditional. Um, but I love this verse, not for the reason why I love it now. I love this verse because this was how we ended the service. This was the benediction. And the reason why I love this verse is because I knew that the service is over, over after the reading of this verse. And then we, had, we could go home and eat my mom's food, which if any of you got, had a privilege to, to, to eat her food, it's always very delicious. Uh, and, and, uh, and then you take a holy nap, uh, you know, after that because it just knocks you out, uh, you know. And so, but today I love this verse for a different reason. And I want us to read it together. I want us to read it together. And it says this, ready? One, two, three. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And um, today I love this verse because it has so much more meaning to me. It has a deeper meaning to me than just the end of the service, great food and a good nap. Um, and I want to break this verse down to you a little bit um, because it has, I think, each, uh, each, sent, each part of the sentence here can be a sermon in itself. And, um, but I want to kind of quickly run through you and give you some nuggets from this verse. Um, when you get saved, when you are saved, you receive gifts from the Godhead. And this verse gives us a, 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 it encompasses all the gifts that we receive during our salvation. So, during the time, during the, in the moment of our salvation, I believe that you receive three gifts. If you take in notes, in the moment of your salvation, you receive three gifts. Each gift from each Godhead. And first gift that you receive that the scripture shows us here is the gift of the Father. Say the gift of the Father. And the gift of the Father that is given to you is the gift of love. Say gift of love. The Father gives you a gift of love. It might sound simple in, on the surface, but it's actually very profound. What moves you, what drives you, what sustains you is love. So many people find themselves in bad situations in life simply because they're searching for love. Many people find themselves in addictions, in drugs, and alcohol, find themselves in abusive relationship. You will think, why would the person stay willingly in an abusive relationship, physical, verbal? Why, you know, a common sense dictates run when you're in danger. But because they're earning for love, because they're seeking love, they will go through hell in their life just for that drop of attention, that drop of love. You and I, we were created with this God-sized hole within us. And that only God, Bible says, who is love can feel it. We have need for love. Our language is love. And if we don't receive love, we are deficient in our being. If we don't have love in our life, something is missing. And um, as human beings, we are created to receive love. I have little kids and you know, their biggest need from me as a parent is love. Now as they grow, as they grow, as they're growing, I'm adding other things in discipline and correction and teaching and guidance and all that stuff. 
But ultimately, when the child is born into this world, all they can receive is love. And babies that are void of love, they literally don't develop properly. They did studies on the babies that were left at birth without receiving touch, receiving care and, and, um, and love. And they're undeveloped in their brain because love is the essential building block to your psychic and even to your physical development. So while it sounds very basic on surface, but love is all that you need, like that song says. And all of us have the need for it. And God who created us, He knows how we take, how we work. He knows what moves us. And when we are saved, he gives us something that no man, no woman, not even parent can give you. We're not even talking about samsasas. He gives us unconditional love. Unconditional love. Because every other love that you receive in this world, even from your parents, because God says, even if your mother will forsake you, there is even, there is no, there is no stronger bond than a bond between a newborn child and a mother. There's something that binds them together. Something that comes out of their body. Their, their, it's part of who they are. But God says that even a mother can abandon a child. But He says, I will never abandon you. His love is unconditional. His love is not based on your performance. His love is not based on uh, what you do, what you don't do. What you have done, what you have not done. It's available to you because you are, you are His creation, you are, you are His son and daughter. And um, it's available for you today. There's some of you that are here that came, maybe you came with a friend, you got invited. Maybe you've seen one of the advertisements or videos on social media and you came here today and you're empty on inside. You're seeking for something new. Maybe you're looking in other religions and other places, uh, trying to find that that to fill that hole that's inside of you I want to tell you that nothing will fill that hole but God himself it's too big of a hole to fill our parents can try to fill it our spouses can try to fill it but at the end of the day you will be empty if God doesn't fill it and today God is offering you the gift of love unconditional love he's not looking what you have done and he's not looking what you can do for him and that's what sets Christianity apart from any other religion. Every other religion has a set of rules and do's and don'ts and something and prerequisites for you to get to God. In Christianity it's opposite. God has come down from heaven for you and He said there's nothing you need to do. You just come and receive my love. Nothing in return. He loved you. Even He knew some of you did not, would not love Him. Um, back. Even if some of you there will take time to come to love Him. He loved the world, Bible says, John 3, 16, that He gave His begotten Son, even though many people in the world would reject Him and never love Him. God is giving you the gift of love. Have you received that gift of love? And sometimes, you know, we receive the gift of love we come to Jesus because we're so broken. There's nothing we can offer to Him. And so we come to Him and we just, we, we just surrender in His love and receive it. But then as we walk with the Lord, as we mature as Christians, we tend to forget about the fact that we still need His love. And we begin to act like an older son, trying to earn His love by our works. My friends, there's nothing you can do turn God's love. The only thing you can do is receive it. Say, I receive God's love for me. Father's love for me. In Jesus' name. So that's the first gift that you get as salvation is Father's love. The second gift that you get as salvation, by, uh, we just read in this verse, is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not listing them in any chronological order or order of importance. Um, just extracting from this verse. 
you receive the grace. Say grace. The grace of Jesus. Yes. The grace of Jesus. It's a very important gift that we receive. If God the Father gives you love, Jesus, who is the Son of God, He is God. At the salvation, He gives you grace. Without grace, you can't come to God. You can't see God. And grace is getting what you do not deserve. Grace, say this with me, grace is getting what I do not deserve. So, I think it's a pretty basic concept for most of us and we received that when we became Christian. For those of you that un, maybe walked away from God or you're an unbeliever in this place, I want to tell you that God has grace for you. Grace is simply means God is giving you, taking your pain and giving you His healing. He's taking your sin and, ta and giving you His forgiveness. He's taking the consequences of sin and giving you His blessing. Grace is what happened on the cross. The great exchange. He took your sin, your pain, your suffering, your addictions, your oppression and gave you His blessing. He took what you deserved, which is punishment for your sin upon Himself and He's given you what He deserved, which was the blessed life because He was a sinless man and He's given it to you. We call that great exchange. We call that grace. But I want to talk to now us the believers. Those that have been walking with the Lord maybe a few months, maybe a year, maybe many years. Because most often we start with grace. Because we're so broken. There's nothing we can do to deserve God. There's nothing we can do to earn His love. We start out in grace. But after walking with the Lord for some time, after learning about His principles, we begin to kind of slide into works. We learn the importance of praying. We learn the importance of giving. We learn the importance of sacrifice. We learn the importance of fasting. We learn all of these principles of God which are given to us to be able to build our life properly. And we begin to we, we begin to apply them in our life and oftentimes we begin to carry that over into our relationship with God and we begin to now approach God based on our merits and our works. Based on what we have done or have not done. And oftentimes we have difficulty coming into God's presence because we feel bad that we didn't pray yesterday. We feel bad that we haven't done something that we should have done. We have feel bad that church was fasting and I wasn't fasting with the church. I was pigging out and having a good time. Uh, we feel bad that um, we maybe even done something sinful or something that we should have not done. And now we started with grace and it became works. And then what begins to happen, we start with grace and we start living out of mercy. Mercy is not receiving what you deserve. It's different than grace. If grace is, grace is getting what you do not deserve, meaning you're getting blessing, mercy is getting what you do not deserve, meaning I deserve punishment because I have sinned, but He has mercy on me. Now I'm forgiven. I don't receive punishment. I mean, that's mercy. I was, I'm not getting what I deserved, but I still feel guilty. I still feel like a sinner. And sometimes we even have these songs in the church. You know, I'm a wretched sinner. I am a poor little sinner. You know, it's all about... Being, and we're more identifying with our old life that's been buried with God, with Christ. We, you know, and 
I don't, I'm not saying some of these songs been well, you know, it's, it's remembering who we used to be now we're not. I'm not saying we shouldn't sing it. That's not what I mean. But I'm saying the mindset that we, uh, we, we embrace that instead of a, I am a righteousness of Christ by the grace of Jesus, I am a son and daughter with, uh, uh, of God. I have a father. We come to him as a prodigal son saying, Father, forgive me. I am not worthy to be your son. Make me your slave. Make me your slave. And we live this enslaved Christianity. And we see the father greeting his prodigal son, the son that messed up, a son that blew his inheritance. A son that, Bible says, spent his inheritance with harlots. A son that parted and did all kinds of things like some of us. We, we, we messed up. We really messed up. And we come to God and we say, God, I don't deserve a good marriage. God, I don't deserve a good life. God, I don't deserve a blessed life. God, I don't deserve breakthrough in my family, in my business, in my career. Lord, just make me a servant. Just enough food not to die. But I want you to see how the father responds to a prodigal son. I want you to see the gift of grace that you have received. He picks him up. He puts a ring on his finger, which symbolizes authority. He restores him right back into sonship. He puts a sandals on his feet. He gives him the robe of righteousness. It's the grace. I want to tell you today that you don't have to live like a slave in the house of God. You don't have to live based on your merits. You don't have to try to achieve God's love through your works. God has rebuked the church in Revelation. He said, you started in the grace. But now you're... In what are you doing? You're back to works. Let's come back to grace. Listen, grace is not a license to sin. Grace is power to overcome your addiction, your sin, to overcome your, 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 your cycles, that, that, uh, your generational cycles, your oppression. When you truly embrace grace, you understand what you have received on the cross. You don't want to sin. You're like the prodigal son. You look at the place where you're in. You look at that pig sty. You, 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 you look at that food that pigs eat that's been offered to you. You say, what am I doing here? What am I doing wallowing in this addiction, this sin, this pattern? I have grace in the Father's house. Church, let's not settle for slavery in God's house. Let's embrace sonship. Embrace grace. Embrace grace. And I find that the more we walk with the Lord, oftentimes the harder it is to do. Because we know so much of the scripture. We know so much of the principles. And we need to. He helps us to build our life. God has left us the principles to help us to establish us in life. But sometimes we carry that over in our relationship with God. We carry that over and we look at, we think that Jesus looks at us through the things we have done wrong, through the things we have not done. And we think that we are lesser in God's house than a pastor, than a leader, than a prophet. Oh yeah, those people. Of course those people get the blessings of God in their life. Of course those people deserve great things in their marriage. Look at them, how close they walk with God. But me, I'm, I'm struggling. Yeah, I'm trying, but I'm struggling. My friend, you are a son and daughter in the house of God. You're not a slave. Embrace grace in Jesus' name. <laughs> Touch your fellow neighbor and say, embrace grace. That's the gift that Jesus gives you. But it's not, we're not done. There's one more gift that we're going to unwrap today and it's the gift Bible says and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit the communion with the Holy Spirit there is one more gift that God has given you in your new birth 
during your new birth, during your salvation. And it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I know it's the Pentecost and we're celebrating. We had amazing testimonies of manifestation and baptism of the Holy Spirit with manifestation of speaking in tongues. But I want to caution you and to warn you that speaking in tongues is not the Holy Spirit. It's His manifestation. It's His gift. What you have received is much bigger than just the gift of speaking in tongues or any other gift. You receive the gift of the person of the Holy Spirit who is God that lives inside of you. He's in you now. Bible says we are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of our salvation. In your spirit, you have the Spirit of God fused together with your spirit. Bible says you have the mind of Christ. It's the Spirit of God that's in you that gives you that mind. I want you to understand and go beyond the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues is that you have received not just the gift of the Holy Spirit but the Holy Spirit as a person. Godhead is the gift for you that lives inside of you. Are you with me church? Every Christian has the same Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit does not have every Christian the same. Every person in the moment of their salvation have received the Holy Spirit. But what determines the degree and the level that we walk with the Holy Spirit is how much have you surrendered to the Holy Spirit. I know sometimes we sing the songs and even say, and I've said it many times, and we mean well. Holy Spirit, we want more of you. But I want to tell you, church, that you can't have more of Holy Spirit. He was given to you in fullness. You can't have a fracture of the Holy Spirit. You can't have just His leg, His arm, His kidney. Well, I don't know if He has. I don't. But you get the point. You either have Him or you don't. Because oftentimes when we say things like this, we, I, I know what we mean, but I want to correct that mindset. Because when we say, I want more of Holy Spirit, I want, we oftentimes begin to frame Holy Spirit as some kind of wind, power, something more, something else than a person. You either have a person or you don't. And so we have to understand that when oftentimes even we say we want more of the Holy Spirit, it's not that we want you know, add another part to the Holy Spirit to make it more complete, but we want a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? We want more intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. You know, when a husband says to a wife or a wife says to, to, to husband, says, I want more of you. She's not speaking of a physical aspect of a husband, you know, give me more of your body part. No, give me more of your attention. Give me more of your care and love. Give me more of who you are in essence. I want to know the depths of you. That's what we mean when we want to say, uh, that, that's what we mean when we say we want more of the Holy Spirit. So everybody gets the Holy Spirit at salvation, but Holy Spirit gets us at surrender. The more we surrender to Holy Spirit, the more, the, the deeper that relationship that we have with Him, it's the communion with the Holy Spirit with us. He wants fellowship with us. I struggled in my earlier years to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit until a message that, I, that I've heard, I don't remember who was it by, but I thought that was shared that helped me so much to continue to develop my relationship with the Holy Spirit. And the minister said that, realize that the Holy Spirit wants fellowship and communion with you. He wants to talk with you more than you want to talk to Him. 
more that you want to talk to Him. And I realized that Holy Spirit doesn't shy away from me. Holy Spirit, while He's tender, while He's sensitive, but He is open to me. He wants me. He wants that fellowship. All I got to do is be open to Him and say, Holy Spirit, I want to talk to you. The other thought that helped me so much more that I want to share with you too, increase my relationship with Holy Spirit and be consistent in my relationship with the Holy Spirit was that Holy Spirit is a person, He's not it. Holy Spirit is a person and is not it. And that's why I want to talk today more about Holy Spirit than the, than the gift of speaking in tongues. We're going to pray for the gift of speaking in tongues, which I don't know if uh, those of you that were in home group, you, you should have all got it. But just in case we missed a few of you, we're going to pray. It's very easy. You just receive it by faith. But after, I don't want us to reduce Holy Spirit to speaking in tongues. I don't want us to reduce Holy Spirit to an it. I don't want us to reduce Holy Spirit to a cloud, a power, or a manifestation. Manifestation is just that. It's His manifestation of His personality. And He can manifest it differently through different people. But He is a person. Say, Holy Spirit is a person. He is not it. And I will pray to the Father. And He will give you another helper that He may abide with you forever. John 14, 16. That was the words of Jesus. The word another in Greek means alos. Which means one besides another of the same kind. So Jesus is saying that I am praying to the Father that He gives you another one besides me but is like me. So when I go, He will be with you. And Jesus says this, that it is better that I go so that He comes. It is better that I go so He comes. We can't have fellowship with the Holy Spirit if we see Him as a force instead of a friend. If we see Him as a power instead of a person. One time was when I was meditating and having my quiet time with the Lord and was talking to the Holy Spirit. And He asked me this question. He said, if Jesus was on this earth, what would you do? Like if you knew He's in Dallas, Texas. Okay. If you knew he He's in New York City, physically there. If you knew Holy Spirit, let's make it more real in Israel okay it's like what would you do it was just this honest open conversation I said Holy Spirit honestly I would, I would do anything like I would relocate my family just to be near you I would try my best to, to to get in into your inner circle to be your disciple just to be right there at your feet listening to your words listening to you speak watch you perform miracles and, and maybe even be commissioned to work with you on your behalf, like disciples were. And Holy Spirit remind me of the scripture. And He said, but I am here instead of Jesus. And actually Jesus said, that it's better that you have me than Him physically present. Yes, yes. And I begin to think and meditate on those things. And I, and I apologized to the Holy Spirit. I said, Holy Spirit, forgive me for viewing you as a lesser form of a Godhead. As if, you know, sometimes we say Holy Spirit is the third person of a Trinity and a, the, the, the word or the number third always kind of, almost kind of puts him in, in third in rank. But he's equal with, in the Godhead. And he said, I'm here with you. I want to disciple you. I want to speak to you. I'm not limited by time, space, physical location. I can speak to you when you are awake. 
And I can speak to you when you are at, asleep. Jesus won't be able to speak to you when you're asleep. You know, you got to be consciously awake. And he said, if you just allow me and if you see me the way you see Jesus. Yes, I don't have a physical form, but I have a form. It's a spiritual one. I am just as a person as Jesus is. I will show you who I am. We'll go on a beautiful journey together. And we will accomplish so much in this life. Holy Spirit is a person. He has feelings. He has thoughts. The Bible says He has will. In the, script, in the book of Acts says it was, um, it, it was pleasing to the Holy Spirit and us. He has a will to decide. It's time that you understand who the Holy Spirit is. And you continue to build relationship with Him. One of the things that I've learned over time building my relationship with the Holy Spirit was that um, instead of feeling bad and feeling guilty when I maybe miss day, two, three, a week, a month, whatever you, whatever you put on it, whatever time stamp you put on it, whenever I miss some time with Him, whenever I don't fellowship with Him, whenever I ignore Him, I'll feel so bad that this was also stopping me from actually going back to Him and reconnecting with Him. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, you know you should be praying, but you feel bad for not praying yesterday or last week. And this is what's keeping you, the guilt is keeping you for actually praying. Instead of, I want you to switch your mindset. Instead of feeling guilty and instead of feeling bad, feel hungry. Feel like you miss Him. Because He's a person. You know, when I travel and sometimes I get a chance to travel with my wife and it's amazing. But sometimes I travel by myself. We have kids, so she has to attend to them. Uh, and uh, I've used up all my uh, points with my parents and my in-laws for babysitting. So sometimes she has to stay back. And when I leave and I go travel out of the country or someplace when I'm gone, I don't feel bad that I'm not with her. I miss her. I miss her and I look forward to the time that I'm back with her. And so I want you to have this, this type of mindset. Don't let your guilt stop you from fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Don't let the fact that you didn't pray yesterday, the day before yesterday, or even for a week, stop you from coming today to Him and say, Holy Spirit, I miss you actually. You are my best friend. I was looking forward to be with you today. Sorry we didn't have been catching up lately, but I'm so happy to be with you now. And I want to tell you, you're going to get exactly the same response back. You say, buddy, I missed you. Yeah, how's it been going? Tell me about what's, what's been going on. I want to fellowship with you. So the title of my message today is The Gift of Friendship. You are given a gift of friendship. There's a few things that I want to share with you in your development relationship with God and we're going to come to prayer. For three things that, three sins against Holy Spirit that I want you to avoid and stay away from if you want to develop this closeness, intimacy with the Holy Spirit, this personal relationship. Sin number one, Bible says in Matthew chapter 12, 31. Uh, it's the sin of blasphemy. And it says, Therefore I say to you, every sin of blasphemy will be forgiven man, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. What does that mean, blasphemy? It's when you attribute the works of the Holy Spirit as if they were demonic or that the source of it was demonic. Maybe you don't understand deliverance. Maybe you don't understand the prophecy. Maybe you don't understand how this prophet or that prophet is doing things. Maybe you don't understand how that healing was done. Maybe you understand this guy was praying and shaking his hand like this. The other one is stretching like this. The other one did and you're like, what is all this nonsense? I don't know what it is. And so it's better if you don't understand, zip your mouth and see the fruit. If you don't understand what's happening, 
the, the manifestations and the things that are happening, zip your mouth and let God settle the matter. Because just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it's wrong. Just because it's different that you've seen it doesn't mean it's wrong. Just because you can't comprehend how the spiritual work operates, that doesn't mean that they're operating out of familiar spirit or there are witch doctors and witchcraft. Now, there are people that directly take the source from which witches and you know dark side and all that stuff. But I have not seen any witch giving credit to Jesus for healing or deliverance. I have not seen any witch doctor or mason or, or, or any other religion, even new age, giving credit to Jesus for healing, deliverance, salvation. You don't understand it? Leave it be because you might be in danger of blasphemy. You can't develop your relationship with the Holy Spirit if you're blasphemous. Now Apostle Paul does say, I used to be a former blasphemer. 1 Timothy chapter 1.13 Although I was formerly, formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and insolent man, but I, was, I, I, but I obtained mercy because I, didn't, I did it ignorantly and in belief. So if you've said something, if you said something against the work of the Holy Spirit, if you said something about what Holy Spirit has done, and honestly you were just ignorant, you didn't know better. Uh, Apostle Paul says, I was the same. But I obtain mercy. There's forgiveness. There is mercy for you. God is going to forgive you if you repent for it. The Holy Spirit is not going to hold it against you if you repent for it. Sin number two. Sin number two is quenching the Holy Spirit. First Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 19 through 20 says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise the prophecy. I find that do not quench the spirit, do not despise the prophecy is in one sentence. Because prophetic gift, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit, is one of the biggest gifts that is, that, that is misunderstood. And one of the biggest gifts, if I say in all of the gifts of nine of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that gets despised the most. And when we despise the prophecy, when we despise the voice of God, the prophetic, the Bible says we quench the Holy Spirit. Also, it means that when we restrict the power of God from moving, then we quench the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you, the church, not to be a hunters for the fake, but be in pursuit for the real. There are people online and they make a career of that is to expose, 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 expose. Which I don't see any calling in the Bible for exposure. I don't see anywhere where God called anybody to expose. Now, we should counter bad teaching with good teaching. But going around exposing everybody, you run into, the, into a danger by blaspheming, by condemning something that is of God, but you didn't misunderstood. You did not understand it correctly and label it as demonic. Don't restrict the power of God. Don't despise the uh, prophecy. Our hunger for the real power of God has to be greater than our fear for the counterfeit. Listen to this again. Our power, our hunger for the real power of God has to be greater than our fear for the counterfeit. Let's not quench the Holy Spirit. And, not, and the last sin that Bible tells us that we should not do against the Holy Spirit. Bible says, don't grieve the Spirit. First Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day, for the day of redemption. Holy Spirit is grieved when we ignore His promptings. When He calls you to do something, when He puts on your heart to call somebody, to text somebody, to reach out to somebody, to do this, to not do something, to go somewhere or not to go somewhere, to maybe spend extra 15 minutes in prayer, maybe to continue on your fast and continue going, maybe to give something to someone and bless them, but you ignore His promptings, we grieve the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit. Disobedience grieves the Holy Spirit. He just kind of pulls back a bit. He kind of stands in the background. I want to, I want you to examine your life, if, especially if you feel like you're stuck in your relationship with the Holy Spirit. 
go back to the last place of your obedience or disobedience. Go back to the place where last He asked you to do something but you ignored it. Repent for it. Do it if it's appropriate. Or give Him a promise that Lord, when you're going to call upon me, when you pull on my heart, I'm going to do, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to do what you want me to do. In Jesus' name. Don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit of God. And don't grieve the Spirit of God. You're going to have a beautiful life with Him. You're going you're gonna to achieve things with Him far more than you can achieve by yourself. Holy Spirit, Bible says, is a helper. He will help you to do chores. He'll help you to raise your family. He'll help you to be a better uh, wife, uh, a, a, a husband. He'll uh, help you to be a better businessman. He'll help you to be a better worker, be a better co-worker. He'll help you to do better in a ministry. He will help you in every aspect in life. Holy Spirit is not limited only to spiritual things. Holy Spirit is a helper in all things. I encourage you today to develop that intimate and close relationship with Him. On this day of Pentecost, we received not just the gift of speaking in tongues, we received a gift of friendship in Jesus' name. Amen.